So we do continue this morning in our study called We Believe, and we're taking these early Christian creeds, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, to talk about the basics, the core, the fundamentals of the faith of those who belong to Jesus Christ. This morning, we make our way into the second major section of the creed. And as we do so, we come to the central figure in human history. Now, I say that and that sounds, you know, a little overreaching, but I don't think there is anything overreaching about saying that Jesus Christ is the central figure in all of human history. This particular section that we're going to start walking through this week actually begins with the description of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord, describes Jesus as God Himself. And then the very next clause speaks of His birth to Mary. And so we're going to take that clause about the birth of Jesus Christ and we're going to sort of scoot around it and we're going to save it for our Sunday morning before Christmas Day. So we're going to come back to that section as we finish up this study called We Believe. But the rest of the section about Jesus Christ is what we're going to talk about this morning. And so we now get to talk about the life, the death, and the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. These things, friends, are in fact such a critical part of human history and so central to what we believe as Christians that the church for 2,000 years has spent a lot of time and effort clarifying the truths about Jesus and working very hard to hang on to the truths about Jesus Christ. Every go, everywhere we go to spread the good news of Jesus, we hang on to the truths. Everywhere people like us sort of plod through our week to week to week and year by year devotion to Jesus Christ, we work very hard to hang on to these truths. And it's work sometimes because the human heart, we in our brokenness and sin, we have done a lot of work, but this kind of work is trying to explain away the power and the influence and the life and the truth about Jesus Christ. The human heart has done a lot of work to try to explain away Jesus Christ. He's a fascinating figure in a lot of ways. You see people who love Him and adore Him and want to live their lives according to the word and the power of Jesus Christ. We, we study Him. We, we, we pray. We try to live according to His life and His spirit. People who actually absolutely hate Jesus Christ study Him and do everything they can to deny who He is and to deny His influence. People who believe that Jesus never actually existed devote their lives to studying Him and trying to debunk who He is. Jesus is at the center of human history, even no matter what you think about Him. The last couple of weeks, we've spent a little bit of time going through some of the, the polling data and the statistics about what people believe about God, the, the unbiblical things that people believe about the Christian faith and how the creeds clarify those things. Well, the misunderstandings about Jesus Christ are almost just too legion to mention. Uh, the percentages, the numbers, the stats, the details. For 2,000 years, like I said, the human heart has been trying to explain away Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, it is still popular in some circles to today that de to deny that Jesus actually existed in the first place. In fact, I just saw this uh, about a week and a half ago. One of our leading public thinkers, so to speak, a, a very staunch atheist, has put back out there in the press and the media the belief that, well, Jesus probably never really existed in the first place at all. That belief is so ridiculous and has been debunked so many times and in so many ways it doesn't even deserve attention. And yet people still put it forward. People who take themselves seriously still put it forward that Jesus never existed in the first place. Maybe the most common misunderstanding about Jesus in our culture today is something like this, that Jesus was a wonderful man. He was a great moral teacher, a great religious teacher, but that's it. 
And you see, when we do something like that with Jesus, we reduce him from who he truly is and we put him on par with every other religious teacher, every other moral teacher. If someone else had good things to say that we might be able to, to live by, well, Jesus is just another one of those. And what that does is, as uh, Dorothy Sayers wrote, is it declaws the Lion of Judah. <laughs> it makes him just another ordinary individual man. But it's very common for people to believe that about Jesus. Well, here's one that has been popular for a very long time. Jesus really didn't die on the cross. Well, if we have to understand and maybe even explain away the resurrection, what we're going to say is that when Jesus was hung on the cross, what he did is he fainted. He didn't really die. He just fainted, and he held his breath for a very long time. And when he was put in the tomb, the, the coolness and the moisture in the air revived him, and he woke up and shook off the clothes, pushed away a three-ton stone away from the grave, and, and walked out. He never really died, so there never really was a resurrection. You see, we work very hard at this. Here's another popular one. He really did die on the cross, but he never rose because everybody knows that resurrections don't really happen. One of the more curious false beliefs about Jesus that was very popular in the first two, three, four hundred years of the Christian church is that Jesus was never really human in the first place. What he was was a very convincing ghost. And so some of these writers would say when Jesus and his 12 disciples uh, would walk down the street, there would be 12 sets of footprints instead of 13 because he would hover ever so closely above the ground. See, we do so much to try to explain away who Jesus really was because who he really was and what his life, death, and resurrection really means changes everything about human life. So the church, followers of Jesus Christ, we clarify who he is and we make sure we understand the truth about the life of Jesus Christ. We root his life in history itself and in the testimony of Scripture, what does Scripture really tell us about Jesus? And the church through the ages holds to these fundamental, necessary truths about Jesus Christ. So this is what we together this morning confess. And again, I want us to read this portion of the creed together. So let's do this. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. Let's read from Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. As Paul gives us this beautiful hymn, about who Jesus Christ is and what it means for him to descend to this earth and be born of the Virgin Mary, to live this life, to humble himself to the point of death and resurrection and glorification. Notice as well, because this will become important to us by the time that we're done, how the Apostle Paul seamlessly moves from what our lives should look like, what our lifestyle should look like, what should be going on in our hearts and minds and conversations and attitudes and then who Jesus truly is. You see, this is not a disconnected truth. This is something that affects the way that we live. So Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He is appealing for the unity of the body and the maturity of the church because of who Jesus is. Listen to this. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The truth of who Jesus is. He emptied himself and he was born in the likeness of human flesh. And he humbled himself by becoming obedient even to the point of death, the death on the cross itself. It is absolutely central to our understanding of who Jesus is that he is both fully God and fully man. Paul says he was in the form of God. He was God. He was equal to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And though he was in that form, he did not consider it something to be held on to, to hang on to, but he considered something else of even more value. And that was you and me. So he releases that position as the kind of language that Paul uses. He empties himself of that and becomes born in this kind of life, in this flesh, to be born and live and die and rise again and ascend into heaven. It is absolutely central that we understand that he was both fully God and fully man, as one of the later church creeds actually puts it. And it is, in fact, guys, that unique combination that makes this story what it is. The God who is fully and completely glorious and powerful and sovereign willingly, is the language Paul uses, became human and submitted himself to death on a cross. Fully God and fully man in the position of Jesus Christ. You see, if we remove God from that equation, then Jesus just is another man who just happened to die on the cross. That's, that's, that's it. We, if we remove God from the equation, it removes so much, and Jesus is just another religious and moral teacher. If we remove man from the equation, then God just is this really convincing, or Jesus just really is this convincing ghost, and he didn't really die on the cross. He just sort of floated away, right? And we lose so much of the power of the cross and what actually happened there. So it's necessary that we hold these things together. So we confess that the crucifixion is real. And we confess that the crucifixion is a singular event that is rooted in time and place. It actually happened at a point in history that we can pinpoint. We can put our fingers on. So part of the creed that we uh, repeated this morning, says that he suffered under Pontius Pilate. What an interesting name to include inside of this creed. This creed is very short. It is very to the point. There's very little space for extra vocabulary. It is just boom, 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 boom. And outside of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there are two people mentioned in this creed. And one is the mother of Jesus, Mary. And we would think, well, Mary belongs in the creed. I mean, after all, right? What a beautiful person. The second human being named in this creed is Pontius Pilate. Now that's odd because he is the man who waffles back and forth. He is the man who doesn't have the strength of his conviction that Jesus is innocent and doesn't deserve to die. So he washes his hand of his death pretending to not be guilty of what happens to Jesus and allows him to be crucified, something that he only had the power to do. Why would we name Pontius Pilate in this creed? Well, look at it like this. The other mythologies or the mythologies that surrounded the early church, the Greco-Roman world of deities, the Babylonian world of deities, the Egyptian world of deities, all of them had this story of this cycle of death and rebirth. 
and it was tied to these quarrels between their capricious gods. It had everything to do with their sort of explanation of why winter happens because every winter uh, this god loses this battle and every spring this god rewins this battle and is reborn. And you've got this cycle of history that happens over and over and over again. It's tied to these things that are utterly mythological, completely disconnected from actual moments in history and cyclical. They happen over and over and over again. And into that, the church says for 2,000 years, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. That's like saying, whatever the date is, on April 14, 33 AD, this is exactly when this happened. It doesn't happen over and over again. It didn't happen in the mythological past where just sort of the fog of history covers it up and we just believe it anyway. We can point to it. We can tell you who was alive. We can tell you who was governor. So the church roots the story of Jesus Christ in verifiable history. It was so important to the early church, this creed and the the inclusion of Pontius Pilate, that the church fathers for two or three more hundred years, two or three hundred more years, would talk about how important it was to keep this phrase in the creed because we're rooting it in human history. It happened once, it happened while Pilate was governor, and now you and I live out the consequences of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the Gospels are actually full of names and full of periods of time and full of history. You see, Jesus walked this earth in a human body while a very particular Roman was governor, while the Herods ruled in Judea, while Caiaphas was high priest, while Peter and John's dads fished the Sea of Galilee. We know who was alive. We stick it in history. This is important to us in a way that maybe we don't often think, but is vital to our confession of faith about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, our lives are lived in time, rooted in time and space. We have a birth date. If the Lord tarries, we're going to have a death date. We live this in family and friends and communities and jobs and ups and downs. And because we live this kind of life in this earth rooted in time, God entered the same kind of life and He walked the same earth And he had the same kind of birthday and the same kind of death day. He lived this kind of life with us. Now notice this. Because we live this kind of life, he comes and lives this as well. The book of Hebrews actually says, because we are of flesh and blood, he decided to become flesh and blood with us. So that he might do for us what only he could do. And that is defeat death and rise from the grave. So we live this life. Jesus enters this life himself, but he lives this life so differently that now on the other side of his life, there's a brand new life possible. Because of his life, something brand new is possible. His life among us changes the way that we live our lives now. So this Jesus, he is no disconnected deity from the distant past, but God himself who walked this earth and suffered the death of the cross. So the creed says he was crucified, he he died, and was buried. When we think of the crucifixion, we have in mind sort of that singular cross, that singular moment. But we should understand something. The Romans loved crucifying people. The Romans crucified maybe tens of thousands thousands of people. There are stories of governors who would crucify hundreds of people at the same time and line the streets of the city with their crosses and with their bodies. So from the outside looking in, when Jesus is hanging on that cross with the two criminals, one on either side, to a normal set of eyes, it's just, oh, the Romans have just crucified somebody else. But what we see in Jesus Christ is not just another crucified man or some criminal who got sideways with the Roman emperor. We see the king of kings. We see our king. 
we see the king of all of human history and all of creation. You see, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ transformed even how we see that bloody and brutal process. He was crucified. He died. So as opposed to all of the silly theories out there that he fainted, he swooned, he floated away, he didn't die, we verify that Jesus died. The Roman soldiers who knew what they were doing, they knew what death looked like, they verified that he died. Several of the women who had followed him for years and had become his disciples, they took his body and they put it through the burial process, their version of embalming, and they wrapped him up and they packed him with spices. They knew he was dead dead. He died like we die so that we might live like He lives. He died a physical death like we die, and He rose again from the grave so that now we may participate in His brand new life. Guys, the truth of the story is the power of this story. We can't pretend to play with the truths that we've been talking about here and still maintain the power of the story of Jesus Christ. The truth of who he is and what happened to him on that cross and on the other side of that grave is the power of the story itself. Why would we change the truth? Why would we present to Jesus who isn't all of this in its fullness, in its brutality and in its glory and in its beauty? Because in that we find the power of change. He was crucified. He died and was buried. And the next phrase in the creed, if you haven't read this a lot or if you haven't read this in a very long time, probably struck you as odd. And you're thinking, we have to repeat this phrase out loud every time we read it. He descended into hell. Other versions of the Apostles' Creed, as you sort of find that, or the Nicene Creed, will change that word hell to death, but it's referring to the same thing. So the church has actually always taught that after the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and before his resurrection, Jesus descends into death itself, where death reigns supreme and he sets captives free. This is actually part of the story of Jesus conquering death itself. He goes there where death rules over everyone, and Jesus opens the door. He takes the keys. He takes captives free, and when Jesus walks out of that grave, Scripture says he carries the keys of death and hell itself. That image is keys are authority. He is the only one now who can open and lock the door of death. He is in charge of death itself. It's beautiful. So he goes where death reigns supreme, and he defeats death itself. Here's how Paul puts part of that story in Ephesians chapter 4. As he speaks of Jesus descending to this earth and being born in flesh and descending even further, leading captives free and then ascending back into heaven. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended to the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who has ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. It is part of the story of the the authority of Jesus Christ in his death and in his resurrection. From one point of view, Jesus' death on the cross looks like the enemy's victory over Jesus. We silenced him. We got him. We managed to manipulate the situation just enough to push through the death of Jesus Christ. And he's hanging on the cross and he's dead. So from one point of view, the cross looks like the enemy's victory. But this is not where the creed stops, is it? The very next phrase in the creed is this. On the third day, He rose from the dead. Here's how the story is told in Luke chapter 24, the first few verses. Keep this in mind. The same women who carried his body, prepared it for the tomb, wrapped it in spices, performed their version of embalming. They go back to the tomb on Sunday morning with more spices to complete the process but something's different. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, 
taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? They came looking for a corpse. They came to take care of and tend to the corpse of a man that they loved. And they hear, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. The truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that he physically rose from the dead and walked out of the tomb on the third day. As stunning as that is, as unique, utterly unique as that is, the truth is, is that it is a physical resurrection from the dead. He died on the cross. He descended into hell. He took the keys from death and hell itself, and he rose again from the dead, and he is still alive. For centuries, human beings have done everything that they can to try to deny or argue against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is not necessarily the time and place to do it, and there isn't time to deal with all of them because there's so many ways in which human beings have tried to do this, but you need to understand this. Absolutely no argument against the resurrection of Jesus Christ has ever succeeded. We know it's true. History teaches us it's true. The Gospels teach us it's true. Changed lives teach us that it is true. There were witnesses to a to a risen Savior. There were a lot of witnesses to a risen Savior. There were witnesses over time to a risen Jesus Christ. We have the profound change in so many lives from Peter to Paul and so many others. A movement that has spanned the ages no matter how hard human governments have tried to squash it from time to time, the church exists through it all. The Gospels pass the test of scrutiny and historical reliability and on and on it goes. So the church has believed and held on to these truths, solidified in our creed so that we can repeat them just as our brothers and sisters have for 2,000 years. But the resurrection is real. It's not metaphorical. It's not psychological. It's not spiritual. It's not a useful belief. It's a true belief that Jesus rose from the grave. The Nicene Creed, It's what's on the banner outside. It's on one of the sides of the little bookmarks that we have for you guys. The Nicene Creed says, the third day he rose again and then adds this phrase, according to the Scriptures. You see, we learn this, that if you had been paying attention in the Old Testament, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ actually doesn't take you by surprise. You remember what the angels told those women? See, don't you remember that he told you that the Son of Man had to be delivered into the hands of evil men? be crucified, and then rise again on the third day. In the very first sermon preached in the church, it happens in Acts chapter 2, and Peter is standing there on the first day of, of Pentecost as we mark it, and he's talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it changes everything inside of their lives. <clears throat> and this is part of what he says in Acts 2, and as he does so, he quotes from Psalm chapter 16, and here's what he says. God raised him up, speaking of Jesus, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter says, we all knew that this happened. He says, all of us here are witnesses to what happened at the resurrection of Jesus. And in fact, we've been told that this was going to happen. And here's what David says about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
This idea, this phrase about the resurrection of Jesus sits at the center of the creed as a matter of just poetry. You can actually diagram it. And on the third day he rose is right at the middle of the creed. It's the hinge upon which everything else works. It sits at the center of that creed because it sits at the center of our faith. We sinned and we broke relationship with God. So God sends His Son, Jesus, to live among us, to die and to rise again. Jesus loves us, died for us, defeated the enemy that we needed defeated, but did not have the power to defeat, rose again from the grave so that you and I may live in His victory. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is all about the resurrection of Jesus and what it means. And here's part of what he says, trying to emphasize how critical this is for us. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, well, they've just perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the promise, the guarantee of life eternal with Him. So on the third day, He rose from the grave. And the creed says, And He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So the story doesn't end with resurrection from the dead. Isn't that magnificent? Then he lived out the rest of his normal human life, moved to the south of France, and just died a natural death there. About a decade ago, a very serious book was published, and that was the theory. No joke. He married Mary Magdalene and moved to the south of France and lived out the rest of his life. We try very hard to deny the truths of Jesus. But he ascended into heaven. So the story doesn't end there. In fact, the next step of the creed that he ascends into heaven tells us that the story continues, that you and I now, as followers of Jesus Christ, we now work and live inside of this kingdom, and we now wait, we anticipate his next coming. You see, the ascension of Jesus is not about his absence from, but it is about his sovereign presence and power over all. And his ascension then means the presence, the falling down of, the coming down of the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. See, he doesn't disappear. He is now sovereign over all. So there is still a lot of work for you and me to do. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we now carry this story with us everywhere we go because people need to hear about Jesus. There is a kingdom of God to live in and to work in, and there is a future to look forward to that has been secured by Jesus. The future coming of Jesus Christ is not dependent upon us or circumstances or global politics. It is entirely dependent upon the moment when the Father tells the Son, go get them. That's it. After Jesus rose from the dead, as the Gospels tell it, and as the book of Acts tells part of this story, he spent a little over a month with his disciples telling them that they would receive the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, and they would become his witnesses. We would become his witnesses to the rest of the world until he returns again. We read the first few verses of Luke 24. I want to read the last few verses of Luke 24 as Luke tells us this part of the story. And Jesus said to them, thus it is written, and notice again how Christ just pulls it all together for us. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them 
and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. He ascends into heaven. And as the creed puts it, he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And that's actually a powerful biblical image. It's an important piece of this story. That he sins in heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. It's a biblical image of authority and position. It's a biblical image of sonship. Only Jesus in the completion of his work could sit at the right hand of the Father. So it's an image of his sonship and authority. But it is also an image of the completed work of Jesus Christ. And it's a powerful image. You see, if you dig a little bit further into the Old Testament and you watch the lives of priests who worked in the temple, you see their job, the job at least for most of these priests, is they would receive uh, people as they would come in with their sacrifices and they would dispose of those sacrifices and butcher those sacrifices and give certain meats to them and they would burn the rest of it and they would do this over and over and over, day after day and year after year. And the image is, is when priests would work in the Old Testament temple, they could never sit down because their job was never done. They couldn't just offer sacrifice and then they were done. That same family would show up at the next feast. That same family would show up the next day. That same family would show up a year later because they had to offer another sacrifice because they had sinned. And so the priests stand up and they continually offer sacrifices. The book of Hebrews says, continually offer sacrifices day after day because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. So they never sit down. So the creed says, He ascended into heaven, and he does what? He sits down. The one sacrifice of Jesus Christ finishes it all. And when I put my trust in Jesus, my sins are forgiven. I don't need to offer the sacrifice of my deeds, of my works, that I might be accepted by him. The sacrifice of Jesus is complete and done And it is final. It's beautiful. And then the creed says, and from there, from the right hand of the Father, that position of authority, that position of victory, from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. So we anticipate. This is actually a lot of what Advent teaches us that we take this thing that happens every single year and we do it over and over and over so that as we remember and celebrate and are thankful for the birth of Jesus Christ and what his life means, it reminds us to anticipate the second coming of Jesus. It draws us back into this life of working for him and waiting for him and looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ again. Scripture teaches, and we confess in the creed, that he will come in all of his glory and all of his power to judge the living and the dead, every human being who has ever lived, and establish his perfect and eternal reign over a new heaven and a new earth. Our culture hates the word judge. We don't know what to do with it. We get really grumpy about it. We like other words instead. We tell people not to do it. We get angry when we feel like we have been judged. And on and on and on it goes. Our culture has taken that word and it's using it as a cudgel against other people. And yet here it is in the creed and you and I speak it and you and I confess it and you and I believe it that Jesus will come and he will judge everything. Everything. He is the only one who can. He is the only one who has the wisdom and the power and the authority to do that. And to judge, in this sense, in the end, what it means is to put everything right. This is a description of the moment of the great cosmic putting right. It is the kind of justice that every human heart longs for and that every human heart knows needs to happen. This is why evil bugs us so much. It can't happen this way. This is unfair. This is unjust. Someone has to fix this. Every human heart longs for this. It is the kind of justice that you and I can really only taste from time to time. 
but which we fail at in the end so miserably. We work for it where we can. We strive for it where we have the kind of power and resources where we might be able to affect a little bit of justice here and there. But there is so much more that needs to be put right. Guys, the human heart has gone completely wrong and no human scheme can ever put that right. It's just a matter of logic. If every human heart is broken in its sin and you put together the wisest and most wealthy human hearts inside of a room to concoct a scheme that fixes the human heart, that scheme is going to be filled with human hearts broken in their sin. It's a cycle that cannot be broken unless it's broken from the outside. Only the Creator Himself can solve what the human heart has broken. Only Jesus Christ can come as judge the living and the dead. Recreate a new heaven and a new earth, and his children will dwell with him forever. Look again at Philippians chapter 2, verses 9, 10, and 11, the, the end of that section that we read. Therefore God has highly exalted him, that position of authority and power, and has bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We belong to this Jesus. It is the truth of who He is and what this is that makes the difference in our lives. It makes the difference in human history. So now we live in this, and we become ambassadors of this as the church of Jesus Christ, which is, in fact, one of the things the creed is going to remind us of just a little bit later on. I want us to notice this as well in our last thought. In, first, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, the very next thought that Paul, excuse me, that, yeah, that Paul has, verse 12, he says this, Therefore, <laughs> because all of this is true, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see, this means something now that we get to live in and work in and that changes us. The death, the resurrection, and the promise of his return means brand new life. What we've gone through here from Pontius Pilate to an empty tomb to a moment of ascension, this is not a history lesson. It just helps us make sense of some piece of life. This is the story that changes now the way that we can live. It's a description of reality itself. It's the script behind the brand new play that we act in. Our sin wrote one kind of script And it is full of brokenness and darkness and sin and rebellion. But this is a brand new script. And it is full of the life and the light of Jesus Christ. And it is full of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit to be witnesses to this story everywhere we go. The author Eugene Peterson, he wrote about it, and read just a little bit of what he says here. Just as Jesus' birth launches us into the creation, and Jesus' death launches us into history, Jesus' resurrection launches us into living in community, the holy community, the community of resurrection. This is a community of resurrection that we are in this morning. It is critical that we get inside this and make it our own critical that we realize not just that the resurrection happened, but that it happens in the living Word of Jesus Christ, worked out in the lives of His children. Let's pray.